console cables. For decades, this is how we configured our Cisco devices. We would go to one device, configure it, go to the next device, configure it, and so on and so on. If we got really advanced, we might connect remotely using Secure Shell, or heaven forbid, Telnet. But the point is, we configured one device at a time, giving appropriate configuration commands for that device. And today, that is just not scalable. And the great news is that there is a fundamental paradigm shift happening in the industry right now that we oftentimes refer to as network programmability, where we can do what Cisco refers to as intent-based networking. Without even having to know all of the commands on all the different platforms, we can express our intent through programs. And that intent might go out to a network controller, for example, and that can send appropriate configuration instructions out to the end devices. And to get us ready for this new world, Cisco has a certification that they call the Cisco Certified DevNet Associate. And that's what we're going to be focusing on in this video. We're going to be taking a look at four different things I want you to know about the Cisco DevNet certification to help you decide, is that a certification for you or not? Hi, my name is Kevin Wallace. I'm a double CCA, and here's what's on tap for this video. We're going to begin with an overview of what is network programmability and what can it do for us. We'll learn several different terms. Then we'll talk about how we can create a model that represents the configuration of a router interface, regardless of what actual configuration commands the router needs, and how that model can be used to send out appropriate commands to our network device that we want to configure. Then we'll consider the DevOps lifecycle. We'll talk about how the developers and the network operations teams are now working together in this DevOps lifecycle. Then I want to identify for you four major topics on the DevNet Associate exam that you'll definitely need to know. Now let's get started in our discussion with an overview of network programmability. Oh, and before we get going, I've got a free gift for you. You can download absolutely free our DevNet Associate, that's exam number 200-901, our DevNet Associate practice exam. This does not have any brain dump questions in it. We're very anti-brain dump here at KW Train. All the questions in this practice exam were written by the KW Train instructors. If you'd like to download your free PDF that has over 100 questions and very detailed explanations, just go to kwtrain.com slash 200-901. That's the exam number of the DevNet Associate exam, and that's also going to give you our three-part DevNet Associate mini course. You see the video you're watching right now on YouTube, this is part one of that three-part series. But if you want to see the other two parts, you need to get signed up. It's totally free. Just go to kwtrain.com slash 200-901. Now, let's get into our discussion of network programmability. And by network programmability, I mean that we can configure the devices on screen with programs rather than going to them directly. Now, traditionally, routers and switches have three different planes of operation. We have the data plane that's concerned with getting bits in one interface as quickly as possible and sending them out the appropriate egress interface as quickly as possible. Up at the control plane, that's where any sort of algorithm would run. If we're running OSPF on a router, that Dijkstra algorithm used by OSPF, that runs at the control plane. On a switch, spanning tree protocol, that's going to run at the control plane. And the management plane, that's how we as network administrators connect to the device for administrative purposes. And as we go through this discussion, there are going to be several terms I want you to know. The first term is a distributed control plane. That's what we have traditionally, meaning that the control plane is distributed across devices, where every device has its own control plane. However, what we might do instead, as we start to migrate towards network programmability, is to have an SDN controller. That's a software-defined networking controller and in some SDN controllers, we can take the control planes from our network devices and have those control planes run on the controller. So the controller is in charge of running those algorithms. And that brings up the question, how does a device like a router know how to forward packets if its control plane is no longer on the router? Well, that SDN controller is going to be communicating down to those devices using something called an API, an Application Programming Interface. An API is basically the way one piece of software talks to another piece of software. And in the SDN world, uh, the APIs that run between the controller and uh, the devices being controlled, they're often referred to as southbound APIs, or southbound interfaces for short. 
The reason is, if you think of a compass, we think of south as being down, and normally this is how we draw things where the devices being controlled are down. They're below the SDN controller. And we can abbreviate these southbound application programming interfaces as simply SBIs. And notice that we are no longer using a distributed control plane. We now have all the control planes living in the SDN controller. We now have a centralized control plane. And the controller is communicating with our devices using some sort of API. As an example, one of the big industry standard southbound APIs is called OpenFlow. So these SBIs, that's how the SDN controller is going to be sending out configuration instructions or maybe making queries about the configuration of a device. But we talked about this concept of intent-based networking. How do we express our intent to the SDN controller? Well, that's going to be done through an application. And we typically represent the applications as being above or north of the SDN controller. So you guessed it, these are NBIs, northbound APIs. And these APIs are a bit different than something like OpenFlow that we would use with a southbound interface. Here, we're often using something called REST APIs. REST, that stands for Representational State Transfer. And this is very similar to going out to a website and asking for a web page to be brought down. When we do that on a website, we're using HTTP verbs like post or get. Same thing here. REST is using HTTP verbs to send information to and request information from the SDN controller. And the information being sent by these HTTP verbs, it has to be in a certain format. One format is XML, Extensible Markup Language, that you might have heard of. Another very popular one is JSON. That stands for JavaScript Object Notation. And with this infrastructure, we can now have applications that maybe we or somebody else writes in a programming language like Python to send these JSON formatted commands inside of HTTP verbs, which are using those REST APIs, down to the controller to express our intent. The controller then takes our intent, which might be to secure a particular type of traffic, give a quality of service treatment to another type of traffic. It's going to express that intent using appropriate commands down to those network devices. No longer do we have to take our console cable and go from device to device to device. We express our intent one time and it gets pushed out to all those end devices. As an example, let's say that we're trying to configure a router interface. How would we do that fairly generically where we could talk to different types of routers? Well, what we could do is model the data contained in an interface configuration. To help us think about data modeling, let's consider an iPhone. When Apple came out with the iPhone 14 Pro, they had a couple of models. They had the 14 Pro and the 14 Pro Max. And we had a couple of display sizes. One display size was 6.1 inches diagonal. The other was 6.7 inches. And they were available in a variety of colors. Space black, silver, gold, deep purple. And we could specify what storage capacity we wanted, starting at 128 gig, going all the way up to one terabyte. And by going through these different characteristics, I can specify the kind of iPhone 14 Pro that I might want. Maybe I want a 14 Pro Max with a 6.7 inch diagonal display size. I want the color to be space black and I want the storage capacity to be 512 gig. This is an example of a data model. We've got these four different characteristics that I populate with a value and I've modeled uh, the kind of iPhone 14 that I want. Now let's consider how we might model data for something like a network interface. Here we have a module called IETF Interfaces. IETF, that's a standards body. So this means we're not doing this specifically for Cisco. This could be Cisco, Juniper, a variety of other vendors. But up at the top, it says IETF Interfaces. That's the name of the module. And that gives us the hint that we're going to be doing something to configure a network interface. And notice that this module has a couple of containers. One says RW interfaces, one says RO interfaces state. RW means we can read or write information. So we could set the name. We could set whether or not this interface is enabled in that container because it's read write, but the RO interfaces state container, that's read only. So we could only retrieve information from there. And within each container, we have a list. In the top container, we have RW interface star name. We could put the name of an interface there, like Gigabit Ethernet 1, and then we could make a copy of that 
and have another list for Gigabit Ethernet 2 and so on. This is just the structure. We've not yet populated it with any specific information, but we will see that in just a moment. But on RW interface star name, name again is going to be the name of our interface, and that is called the key. And these different parameters we can specify for that interface, each of those parameters is called a leaf. For example, RW description question mark, that's representing a description that we're giving of an interface. And notice it says string in the right-hand column. That means this could be a string of alphanumeric characters where we're describing the purpose in life for this interface. And sometimes the data type for a leaf is very simple, like a string. Other times we might be specifying another data type. For example, here, RO last change where we're trying to query the device and say, hey, what is the last time that somebody made a change here? What's the date and time? Notice that that's not a string. That's yet another model. It's yang colon date hyphen and hyphen time. And again, this module is not populated. This is just the structure that we could populate. Let's take a look at a populated example. Here it says interfaces XMLNS. That means XML namespace, where XML is extensible markup language. Everything is going to be formatted here in XML format. And that XML namespace is followed by, in quotes, the namespace. And I said this was going to be in XML format. With XML, we have a start tag and an end tag. And this whole interfaces screen we have here begins with interfaces, and it ends on the bottom line with forward slash interfaces. That forward slash interfaces, that is going to be the end tag that closes out the start tag of interfaces. And this entire interfaces container can contain information for multiple interfaces. We can have different interface nodes. First, consider Gigabit Ethernet 1. That is going to have some parameters for interface Gigabit Ethernet 1. And nested inside of that interface is another node. We have an IP version 4 node. This is saying that Gigabit Ethernet 1 is going to have an IP version 4 address of 10.10.10.10 with a slash 24 subnet mask. And that's just one interface node. If you look further down, we have other interface nodes. We have one for Gigabit Ethernet 2 and also Gigabit Ethernet 3. We've just made multiple copies of that generic format for an interface and inserted different names. Here we're saying the name for that first interface is Gigabit Ethernet 1. That one parameter for an interface is called a leaf and we can have multiple parameters. So what we've done here is very generically said, here's how I want to configure an interface. And what we can do is push this XML formatted configuration out to a device that's going to understand it. it. Doesn't have to be Cisco. It's just going to be a device that understands this Yang data in XML format. And we could use something called NetConf to push the configuration out to a device like a router. Traditionally, we might have used uh, the command line interface and uh, Telnet or Secure Shell to do configuration on the router. And we could also give show commands to retrieve information from the router. We could even use SNMP, the Simple Network Management Protocol, to pull configuration information or even push configuration information uh, to the router. But it just doesn't scale to the level we need today. What we can do instead is use this thing called NetConf, which is a contraction of network configuration. And NetConf is going to allow us to take that XML formatted data, and we know that data contains Yang formatted configuration, and we can send that in that XML format to the device. Much like we would have a network client talking to a network server and sending a request and getting a reply, with NetConf, it is very similar. With NetConf, instead of having a client server, we have a manager agent, and we can send information from our NetConf manager over to the device being configured, our agent. And the data itself that represents the configuration of an interface in our example, that is represented in a Yang data model. And it's formatted, as we saw, inside of XML, extensible markup language. And then NetConf is used to wrap up XML and send that from the manager to the agent. And while NetConf is great, it's not our only option. We also have RESTConf. REST, representational state transfer, we said we were going to be using HTTP verbs, much like a client going to a web server. Well, here with RESTConf, we're still using the same data model that we used with NetConf. We could use XML formatted data if we wanted to, but now we've got the flexibility of alternately choosing JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. And I said that we're going to be using HTTP verbs to communicate with the device we're configuring. Here is an example of those verbs and what the NetConf operation would look like. 
We often use the acronym of CRUD, and uh, CRUD is where C stands for create, R stands for read, U stands for update, and D stands for delete. And if you take the first letter of those, we get CRUD. And uh, the common HTTP verbs we use for CRUD are, we use the POST verb to create something that did not exist previously, we use the GET verb to retrieve information, we use the PUT or the PATCH verb to update an existing record, or if we want to get rid of a record, we could delete it. Now let's ask the question, who's going to be doing this? Because if you look at a lot of IT departments, there are two different silos. We have the software development folks and we have IT operations. But recently there has been a joining together of the software development and the IT operations camps into something we call DevOps for development and operations. And here we want to take a look at the DevOps lifecycle. You see, it's a never ending path. Maybe we get people together from both departments and we plan out what we want to do. What sort of features do we want to add to the network? And the software development people go to work and they code it out, they build it, they test it locally within software development, and when they think it's ready for prime time, they'll send it over to the IT operations people and say, all right, we're releasing it to you. Then the IT operations department is going to deploy it into the wild. Then it will operate for a while, and during that time, IT operations is going to monitor what's going on. And based on what they've seen and measured, or maybe any issues they had, they will go back to the planning phase, and this is a continuous iteration. And I want us to focus just for a moment on the deploy phase, because there are some different deployment tools that you might hear about. Deploying is when we're sending our code out to the devices to do the configuration, and there are different deployment tools out there. One you might hear about is called Puppet. There's another one called Chef. And another very popular one is called Ansible. And what we have been discussing in this video are topics that you're likely to run into as you're studying for your DevNet Associate exam. In fact, let's wrap up by taking a look at some major topics on the DevNet Associate exam. One thing you'll want to be somewhat familiar with is an operating system called Linux. A lot of our configuration is done on a Linux operating system. And uh, the programming language that is usually used to write the applications, it's called Python. It doesn't have to be, but it's very popular. And we talked about APIs that could uh, talk between two different pieces of software. Well, there are different APIs on different platforms. And uh, the DevNet Associate exam gets into APIs on the Meraki platform, Cisco DNA Center within a data center. And if you have something like Cisco Unified Communications Manager, you're doing collaboration. Yeah, you can have APIs in the collaboration world. We can also use APIs to better secure our network. And you'll also be learning more about NetConf and RESTConf as we've discussed in this video. You'll be getting into how that's configured. And you'll talk more about the Yang data model, how to deploy your applications, how to secure those applications. And something really interesting about the DevNet Associate exam is you can take it first. You don't have to take CCNA as a prerequisite. You can go directly for DevNet Associate. Of course, the concern is if you skip CCNA, you're missing a lot of those foundational networking topics. After all, how can you write programs to do configuration for a router if you don't know how the router works to begin with? So to bring you up to speed a bit on network fundamentals, the DevNet Associate curriculum goes through network fundamentals. And this video has been a high-level overview of the DevNet Associate exam, and this video is the first in a series of videos that make up our DevNet Associate mini-course, where we want to get you a lot more comfortable with network programmability. And in our next video, we're going to be focusing on Python. We're going to show you how to install Python and how to do some basic programming with Python. And if you have already signed up for our DevNet Associate mini-course, you should be getting an email tomorrow with the link to go watch the Python video. However, if you're watching this first video on YouTube and you've not yet signed up for our mini course, there's a link on screen where you can do so. Otherwise, if you did find this video through YouTube, you're not going to be able to see the remainder of the mini course. So go ahead and get signed up and I will see you back tomorrow for a look at Python. Python.